Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for logging on tonight to attend this program. Anne, Bonnie, and Mary Reed, The Real Story of Female Pirates. My name is Susan Eastland and I'm on the programming team here at Cary Library. Before we begin, I just have a few things to note. Please let me know in the chat if you have any technical issues that I can try to resolve throughout the program. If you have any questions for our speaker, please put them in the Q&A and we will go through them at the end of the presentation. And lastly, this program is made possible by the generous donors to the Cary Library Foundation. Leading us this evening is Dr. Charlotte Carrington Farmer, an Associate Professor of History at Roger Williams University, my alma mater, who specializes in early American history. She received her PhD from the University of Cambridge in 2010. Her publications include a biography of Thomas Morton in Atlantic Lives, Biographies That Cross the Ocean, a chapter called Roger Williams and the Architecture of Religious Liberty in Law and Religion and the Liberal State, and the rise and fall of the Narragansett Pacer in Rhode Island history. Her interests include descent in 17th century New England, equine history in the early modern Atlantic world, and of course, pirates. So now please welcome Dr. Charlotte Carrington Farmer. Thank you so much uh, for that fabulous introduction, uh, Susan. Really out of all the things that um, I get to research and teach, I think pirates will always hold um, a special place in my heart. Uh, and what Susan didn't actually specifically say is that um, her, she took the class I teach at Roger on pirates, sailors and whalers with me, you know, several, a few years ago now. And I actually see another one of her fellow students, Megan, just popping in. It's so nice. It's like a little reunion. Um, and, and Susan actually did her own research, her senior thesis on pirate executions. And it was an absolutely outstanding A-grade piece of work. So uh, any questions on pirate executions, I'm going to hand you right back to you, Susan. All right, let me go ahead and start my screen share. I'm so happy to be with you tonight. Um, I'm down in uh, Rhode Island and it started to snow. So the thought of driving up to uh, Lexington um, didn't seem particularly appealing. So being online, I think was a good call. Uh, so my plan of attack then is to talk for about, I don't know, uh, 45, maybe 50 <laughs> minutes to allow 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. Uh, as Susan said, if you have any questions, just throw them in the chat and I will uh, get to them at the end. Um, you know, feel free to mute yourself as we go. But as I'm talking, it will be super if you could just mute yourself. Um, all right then, so let's dive right into this then. Um, mm -hmm. All right, so let's think then about um, Anne, Bonnie and Mary Reed. I'm just gonna minimize this. So I feel like uh, when we think about pirates, we tend to always think, I think, in our imagination of male pirates. And if I ask you to perhaps draw a pirate, you would do um, a man perhaps with a, a hat on, with the skull and crossbones on, he'd probably be wearing a buckle, he might have um, a peg leg, uh, a hook on his arm, maybe a parrot on his shoulder, uh, maybe I'd have a bandana on um, and a raggedy top as well, perhaps. And I don't know if any of you perhaps automatically visualize um, a woman when you think about pirates. Um, and I want to kind of shift that narrative uh, today. So when we think about female pirates, we do have some precedents uh, really kind of moving more into the mainstream. Um, I picked a few examples at random to start with. So on the top left, we have Kira Knightley in the really successful franchise of the Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, playing the fiction, um, uh, the, the fiction pirate, um, Elizabeth Swan. Um, we also have um, in the middle of the screen what you see, Anne Bonny, one of the women we'll be talking about tonight. Um, she's in the middle of the screen and also at the top right. Uh, the middle image is from um, the computer game franchise, Assassin's Creed, their one that was uh, called Black Flag, which focused on pirates. And then the other image that we have from uh, Hollywood is the more recent TV series, Black Sails. And so I want to kind of hone in then kind of chronologically to, you know, about a 
10 to 15 year period at the start of the 18th century. And geographically, we're going to be in, in a couple of areas. We're going to start our story in Europe for both Mary and Anne. And then we're kind of going to move kind of across the Atlantic to North America and then down to the Caribbean. So this is chronologically and geographically where we're going to spend most of our time tonight learning about female pirates, although we will briefly go and talk about China and also Ireland towards the end. So let's start our story then with uh, Mary Reed. So our story for Mary then starts um, in my home country in England. Uh, we believe that Mary uh, was born in England um, towards the end of the 17th century, around the year 1685. Um, uh, we believe then that this is England as Mary would have known it. Um, she was Pro, you'll hear me be a bit vague because some of the sources are kind of contradictory and I'll share the primary sources with you later. We believe though that she was born towards the south of England um, around the capital of London. So Mary's childhood is actually really interesting. Um, so when she was born then, um, her mother's husband who had died at sea was not her father. So she was born as an illegitimate daughter. And her mom then seems really interesting. Her mom seems to be something of a schemer. And in order to get kind of um, child support from her husband's family, Mary's mom decides that the, the most logical way to do this is to dress her recently born daughter Mary up to resemble the son that she'd had who'd recently passed away who'd been born by her husband so this, this feels like an episode of a soap opera already uh, so the mom basically decides that she's going to try and scam the grandma uh, on her husband's side to basically pay and pay pay for this this daughter and the way to do that is to dress uh, mary up in in uh, typically male clothing and have her pretend to be her dead brother I know. Um, so apparently, as the story goes, her grandmother was was fooled and um, mother and daughter lived reasonably well on the inheritance, um, you know, almost into Mary's teenage years. Um, and Mary seemed to, from the fragments of primary sources that we have that survive, uh, seemed to really enjoy dressing in, in uh, her, her dead brother's clothing. She seemed to really relish dressing um, as a boy. Um, and we know then that Mary Reed found work for her teenage years as a, a footboy, and then she also found employment within the maritime world of, um, of ship life. Um, the primary sources describe how Mary grew up, and I quote, this is the second piece on the screen, bold and strong, and she had a roving mind. Um, and apparently she enjoyed taking on this male identity so much that by the time she was 15, maybe 16 or so, she committed to working as a sailor and she enlisted, um, you know, in disguise as a young teenage boy to work aboard a man of war ship. Uh, she then goes on to sign up as a soldier uh, and she fights, as the sources suggest, with gr a great deal of bravery in both the infantry and the cavalry in units in Flanders. Mary then, um, around this time, falls in love with a fellow soldier um, who, you know, um, had presumably thought she was a uh, you know a young boy and she reveals her her secret uh and he's impressed enough that he uh they they decide to get married uh, sadly then the records for him end quite abruptly because he passed away mary then returned back to soldiering and served in the netherlands she then makes what I think is perhaps the most important decision in her early life that sets the course for um, her time as a pirate. So she makes the decision then to get on board a Dutch ship that is bound for, for the West Indies. And on the way then, Mary's ship is captured by pirates. And it was at this point then Mary decides to turn pirate and sail under the Jolly Roger. And if anyone's interested um, in the q and I'll happily talk about uh, the two main ways that people turned pirate in the 18th century, if anyone's interested. So lodge that away as a potential question if you want to know more. So kind of once she gets there, then she meets uh, her new lover. 
uh, her new lover gets into a massive dispute with another pirate. And as is quite typical with early 18th century pirates, when, they, when pirates butt head, the natural thing that they did to resolve these uh, disagreements was to have a duel. And so this is the penultimate point that you see on the screen that um, Mary's lover then agrees to settle this dispute with the other pirate to have this duel at sword and pistol. Mary sees this, Mary I think actually doesn't really believe in her husband and she thinks that uh, uh, her lover is, uh, is gonna die. Uh, and so she then, as the story goes, picks a fight with the same pirate, schedules her own duel with this person uh, pretty much a few hours before and then kill the man upon the spot. Um, so really interesting stories about Mary from the get go. So I'm going to come back to Mary in a minute. This is the background to her. I want to kind of switch then to Anne Bonny's story before we come back to Mary Reed. So Anne Bonny then, uh, we go back over to Europe to start Anne Bonny's story. Um, Anne Bonny then was born in Ireland, uh, likely in and around the Cork area, around the turn of the century, around the year 1700. Just like Mary Reed then, um, Anne Bonny was an illegitimate child. Um, accounts about Anne Bonny's life are particularly scarce, but from what we can piece together, we, we believe that she too was raised in disguise. And her father pretended that she was the child of a relative entrusted to his care. Now, her father then makes the decision, again, that will have a huge impact on um, Anne Bonny's life, to move her across the Atlantic Ocean to Charleston in South Carolina. Now, the records about her father are actually surprisingly fruitful. We know that when he comes to Charleston, he becomes a reasonably prosperous merchant and a planter. Um, from the stories that we have about Anne, she's described um, as growing into a young woman who is both fierce and has a courageous temper. Uh, the records suggest that she may have had red hair. And one of the kind of really interesting stories, and I'm giving you a trigger warning here, is uh, that when a man attempted to rape her, um, at this particular moment, um, she beat him up and um, he was, she beat him up so um, aggressively that he, and this is a quote you see on the screen, he lay ill of it a considerable time. So um, he didn't rape her. Um, we know then that Anne and her father kind of um, don't see eye to eye as time goes on. And uh, Anne then makes a decision to forsake her father and his increasingly growing wealth in the planter system to marry a seafaring man. Around 1718 then, she marries a, soldier, a sailor who goes by two different names. This is how it is working with the um, sources uh, by either John or James Bonney. And, and, and that's how we know her by um, his last name. Um, she makes the decision with him then to move to Nassau in the, in the Bahamas. Um, and this was an epicenter as a sanctuary for pirates. And the, the person that she marries, John or James Bonney, uh, according to multiple contemporary sources, was, quote, not worth a groat. So he's poor, he's got no money. Um, we know then that she continues to dress in men's clothing and she joins this band of pirates where she intersects and joins the same ship as Mary Reed. Um, and so the person who is in charge of this ship that both Anne Bonny and Mary Reed um, eventually join is the pirate who's known as Calico Jack Rackham. And Anne Bonny then um, falls in love with Jack Rackham. So as pirate ships operate, obviously a big part of being a pirate in the early 18th century is uh, seizing other ships and plundering them and taking people kidnap. And again, I can talk more in the Q&A if anyone's interested in like, what is the legal definition of pirates at, piracy at this time? And what type of crimes are pirates um, committing? And what's the law around this? I'll happily talk more about that in the Q&A. But back to Anne and Mary then. So we know that both Anne and Mary aboard a uh, Rackham ship fall into a battle with a British vessel that had specifically been sent there to capture them and Rackham. 
We know then that when the ships came to close quarter, uh, the primary sources reveal, and this is the first point on the screen, that none kept the deck except Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, and more um, and more and more kind of of the other um, pirates kind of hid below deck. The rest of them basically scuttled down into the hold in fear. Um, so these really two strong women kind of um, hold the fort um, as, as I'm in the midst of plundering this vessel. Um, Mary then is such, um, I don't know, a talented pirate, I guess is the word I'm trying to think about. Uh, I'm trying to think. Um, she is so annoyed at the rest of the crew that she basically uh, fired a pistol at them and killed one of the crew and wounded um, others. Um, and we know then that this is this is a grudge that she kind of holds against the rest of her crew for not kind of standing up for themselves and doing their job as pirates. Because later, as Calico Jack Rackham is about to be hung, um, Anne says, and the quote is on the screen, that she was sorry to see him there, i.e. about to be put to death. But if he'd fought like a man, he need not have been hanged like a dog. Uh, so again, we can see this really dynamic leadership and really taking control of the situation that um, they find themselves in. So as we're going along, you'll hear me, you've heard me a little bit being a bit vague, like we think this and the sources suggest. Um, and this is one of the real problems, I think, with um, doing pirate history and in particular trying to piece together the lives of, of the two pirates Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. Um, there are two main primary sources, um, original documents that we historians use to tell their stories. Um, and so a lot of the information that I've shared with you thus far comes from the um, early 18th century pamphlet that you see on the screen. Um, so you can see then that this pamphlet was published by Captain Charles Johnson. It was published in London and uh, the, this particular edition, the first edition, came out in 1724. You see this here. And so this book, this book, this pamphlet, it's um, it's got a really cool title. Uh, it's a general history of the pirates from their first rise and settlement um, in the island of Providence, not Providence here, but Providence down in the Caribbean to the present time. Um, we also know then um, that it has case studies here of um, the two female pirates and they're put in really big bold letters on the front to kind of highlight to the readers, um, you know, how integral their stories were. So, you know, with the remarkable actions and adventures of two female pirates, uh, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny, and I should have probably said this at the start, but there's no standardization of spelling in this particular time period. So you can see pirates is spelt with a Y. Um, I's and Y's are often interchangeable as are I's and J's, U's and V's. There are quite often long S's that look like an F. And so in the primary source quotes that I'm sharing with you, I have kept most of the original spelling. So if, if you see weird spellings in quote marks, it's not just me being bad at spelling or spelling things the British way. Uh, I'm just keeping the early 18th century spelling. But what you can also see then in Johnson's A Brief uh, a General History is all of the other um, pirates that, that are listed in here. And for us, chapter seven of Captain Rackham also fleshes out what we know about Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. So this was then a really, really, really popular um, pamphlet in, in the 18th century. It comes out in multiple volumes. Um, the two main volumes are 1724 and again in 1728. Um, we know then that in the 18th century, it's such a success that it's translated into French, Dutch, German, um, and it's published and republished all around um, different parts of Europe. Um, and so what that meant then is that people who were working in the maritime world would have, would have known this book. Um, so it would have made its way to people on ships, working on the docks, working in barns, perhaps working in the brothels that sailors frequented when they were uh, on shore. And, and many people in this, in this period would have known the stories of uh, Mary Reed and Anne Bonny. So it says on the front cover that this, this primary source that is the main source about Anne Bonny and Mary Reed is by Captain Charles Johnson. 
Um, and we have no idea who Charles Johnson is. It's a pseudonym, it's a pen name. Um, historians have, have trolled through the records to try to figure out who this is. And really there's no clear consensus. Um, there's a, there's, it makes perfect sense that the person would not use their real name because um, the authorities would have some really serious questions to ask to be like, how do you know so much about pirates? Um, this particular book has um, an inside knowledge of pirates about how specific uh, ships are governed, about the pirate codes people have, about the origins of people who are serving on the ship. So it must have been someone with, with some inside information. And, and some scholars suggest it could be uh, Daniel Defoe, but there really is no consensus. But this is one of our main primary sources for both um, Mary and Anne. So from this source, um, and then the other source I'm gonna show you in a second then, it seems to paint a picture that Anne Bonny and Mary Reed were fierce swashbuckling women who were genuine pirates in every sense of the word. So when Mary and Anne Bonny are brought um, to, to, uh, to trial, in, in 1720 and in 1721, one of the women who had been captured by them um, as they were working on Rackham's ship described in detail what Anne Bonny and Mary Reed looked like. So in addition to Charles Johnson's source, we've also got this other woman who's known in the records as Dorothy Thomas, who's been captured, who describes what it's like to be captured by these two female pirates. And she writes at length, uh, and this is the second point you see on the screen how both Bonnie and Reed quote wore men's jackets and long trousers and handkerchiefs tied about their heads and had a machet and a pistol in their hands so they've got you know two weapons um uh, and, and it means a machete essentially and a pistol that's what I kept the 18th century spelling um and even though they were dressed as men uh Dorothy Thomas knew the reason of her knowing and believing them to be women was by the largeness of their breasts uh, and I'll come back to dressing in disguise uh, in a minute we know then that from the scattered records that exist that um, when Bonnie and Reed were attacking vessels, it's, it's quite likely that they did wear men's clothes all of the time that that happens. And then other sources suggest that at other times on the ship, they tended to dress in more traditional 18th century women's clothes. Um, we know then from Dorothy Thomas's account that Bonnie and Reed cursed and swore at the men on the ship. Uh, we know that Anne Bonny and uh, Mary Reed told the men on the ship to murder Dorothy uh, with a specific request to prevent her coming against the crew in court. And she describes at length then how both Anne Bonny and Mary Reed um, were very active on board the ship and they were willing to do anything. And what becomes increasingly clear from the sources then is both Bonnie and Reed chose to be on the pirate ships. Um, and the direct quote that you have is that, and at the bottom of the screen, that they were pirates of their own free will and consent. It seems then that both Bonnie and Reed were not simply tolerated by their male counterparts on the ships. It's clear that they ex exercised considerable leadership roles on the vessel. And although they weren't formally elected by their fellow pirates to posts of command, they certainly, it seems, led by example. And again, in the q and I can talk about how pirate ships, ships were governed, uh, if anyone's interested. Um, we know then that both of um, Bonnie and Reed fought in duels. Um, they kept the deck under control during times of engagement. And we know that they were allocated to be part of the group that were designated to board other ships, to board other prizes, which was always reserved for most the most daring and respected crew members. So it does seem that in some way, both Bonnie and Reed made their mark and certainly left some kind of legacy, both as they were serving on the pirate ship, but also within print um, from the primary source I just showed you. Um, there are some sources that speculate that um, Bonnie and Reed were actually lovers, and I'll, I'll come back to this a little bit later when we look at a recent statue that was installed in London of the two of them. So going back to disguise then, you know, how did these women manage to disguise their physical appearance and prevent at times their shipmates discovering um, that they were actually women? 
Um, we know that from 18th century vessels like the ones that Bonnie and Mary operated on, there was little privacy on board. Perhaps there were some hidden dark corners below decks. Um, but what is quite common in the early 18th century is that young boys were taken on board um, the ship to basically learn the ropes um, of sailing. And many and most there were many um active members of the crew who were teenage boys. So we can imagine that dressing in loose trousers, uh, shirts and jackets with a scarf or perhaps a handkerchief around their neck, uh, you know, a strong young woman would have been able to pass, it seems, as a teenage boy. And, you know, pirate ships uh, and any ships of this time period, actually, uh, were wooden ships. And they were kind of this almost like confusing jumble of tarred rope. There was like um, mildew sails, spare masts, spars, muddy anchor cables, uh, hen coops, hammocks, seamen's chests, wooden crakes, barrels with water, salted pork, gunpowder. At times they had animals on deck, cows, goats, ducks, chickens who were often kept on in pens. We know then that seamen also kept pets, dogs, cats, parrots, and monkeys. And I can talk more about actually um, some of the myths and realities about animals on deck if anyone's interested. So it was kind of this busy, chaotic world. And, and you can imagine with a bunch of teenage boys on there dressing as they did, um, it was possible to kind of go undetected. So I feel like when they were working and when they were above deck in this really chaotic world, um, it would have been, you know, doable. But I feel like once um, the women stepped below deck, it became increasingly difficult to hide, um, you know, hide their, um, you know, their, their true identity. Um, if you needed the bathroom, um, the, the bathroom was essentially along the leeward channels, basically a platform along the ship's side, basically spread in the rigging and you would urinate into the sea. Um, there were also two or three boxes known as seats of easement where you would do um, your business. So it was difficult, but not impossible. Um, and this cross-dressing, for the most part, was necessary because women, as a rule, were not allowed uh, to serve um, in the crews of any deep sea vessel of, of any kind. And I'll come back to that um, a little bit later this evening. So the other primary source, the other orig original document that we have about Anne, Bonnie and Mary Reed um, is this one here. So um, this is a spoiler alert. They get caught. Um, and so... Uh, Rackham then and his crew, including Anne, Bonnie and Mary Reed, um, do get caught. Um, and it, it, it's huge newsworthy news, as you could um, imagine. Um, and so you can see here then that this is a published, pamph published pamphlet that describes the trials of Captain John Rackham and the, all the other pirates. Um, you can see here it talks about the trials of Mary Reed and Anne, Bonnie. Um, and so this, again, was really widely published and distributed around the Atlantic world in the early 18th century. So when the crew were, were kind of um, brought to trial, they were given four particular charges that you see on the screen. Number one, that they, the crew, did, um, you know, as pirates do, uh, felonously and in a hostile manner attack, engage and take seven certain fishing boats, and that they assaulted the fishermen and stole their fishing boat, and that they assaulted the fishermen and stole their fish and their fishing tackle that they did upon the high seas in a certain place, distance about three leagues from the island of Hispaniola, set upon, shoot at, and take two certain merchant sloops, and did assault James Dobbin and other mariners. Three, that on the high seas about five leagues from Port Maria Bay in the island of Jamaica, that they did shoot at and take a schooner commanded by Thomas Spenlow and put Spenlow and the other mariners in corporal fear of their lives. And number four, that they did about one league from Dry Harbor Bay, Jamaica, that they did board and enter a merchant sloop called Mary, commanded by Thomas Dillon, and did steal and carry away the sloop and her tackle. So these are the four specific charges that are levied against Rackham and his crew, including Bonnie and Reed. So we have really quite detailed descriptions of the trials transcripts, both manuscript versions and also the published version that you see. Um, and so what happened 
was when they were brought to trial, Jamaica's most powerful men gathered around a court at the Court of Admiralty um, in Santiago de Vega for a series of what ultimately I think were just show trials. I think they'd already decided the outcome before they did this, but they wanted to put on a big show trial. And within the trial transcripts, we have amazing eyewitness accounts and multiple eyewitnesses who were at the trial describe how it was a really grave occasion, um, you know, as um, the coast, coast being infested by those hellhounds of pirates. So 18 members of Calico Jack Rackham's crew had already been convicted and sentenced to hang. Three of them, including Rackham himself, were sentenced to not only hang, but to dangle and decay in chains at strategic points as kind of this moral instruction to seamen who pass kind of in and out of the harbour on their way um, out on seafaring vessels. And one contemporary account described, and I quote, how a public example and to terrify others from other such like evil practices. And, and as I said to you, Susan did a brilliant um, undergraduate senior thesis on uh, pirate executions. Um, and so very much within her wheelhouse. So um, we know then that, you know, these pirates were convicted, but two of the pirates, and this is a final quote you see on the screen, uh, were convicted, but they then pleaded their bellies. They said that they were being quick with child and they prayed that execution might be kind of held off. And those, the two that obviously did this were Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, and they were indeed given respite because they were with child at this time. So the trial transcripts read, and I've I put this on here for you. Um, so when Mary Reed is brought to court, the trial transcripts against her read, the court asked her what pleasure she could have in being concerned in such enterprises where her life was continually in danger by fire or sword. And not only so, but she must be sure of dying and in her death. If she should be taken alive, she answered, that as to hanging, she thought no great hardship, for were it not that every cowardly fellow would turn pirate and so infest the seas that men of courage must starve. And that if it was to be put to the choice of the pirates, they would not have the punishment less than death. Being found quick with child, her execution was respited. And it was possible she would have found favor, she would have been pardoned, but she was seized with the violent fever soon after her trial, of which she died in prison. Um, so we don't know what her fever was. Maybe it was typhus. We're not really sure. Um, and presumably the child um, died um, you know, before it was born with her. Anne Bonny's fate, though, is different to Mary Reed. So Anne Bonny then continued in prison to the time of her laying in and afterwards was reprieved from time to time. So she gets this reprieval. Uh, Charles Johnson in the trial um, publication describes how, but what became of her since we cannot tell, only this we know, she was not executed. So what happened to Anne Bonny? And, you know, historians have like a million and one theories about that, but ultimately the, the primary sources are, are, are unclear. So Anne Bonny then, as you saw, had been memorialized in um, TV shows, computer games. And uh, in 2020, these two statues to Bonny and Reed went up in London at execution dock um, along the River Thames in, in Wapping. Now, we know that obviously we have the potential London connection for, for one of them, but not for the other. The other is, is definitely born in Ireland, likely in Cork. And so... Um, they are not executed in London, they're, they're out in Jamaica when those trials take place, but um, there was huge public attention on, the, on, on Bonnie and Reed after um, the, the Black Flag game and also the, um, the Black Sails computer game, and so they wanted to memorialise these two women, and so these two statues uh, went in in 2020, and then obviously all, we all know what happened as 2020 kicked off, um, and the idea was to move these two statues down to the south of England to to Devon but um, I think that's been put on hold for a, for a couple of different reasons I think they they caused some controversy and I think also there were practical issues but um, if you get the chance while they're still in London I encourage you to go and have a look at them 
So let's try and think then about how Bonnie and Reed fit within kind of this broader legacy of women at sea. Um, so it's pretty clear then, I think, that the story of Anne Bonnie and Mary Reed raises a number of questions. You know, was it so unusual for women to go to sea? And if so, why? Were there other female pirates? Was it essential for a woman to dress as a man if she wanted to join the crew of a ship? You know, how is it possible for a woman to pass herself off as a man in the cramped conditions of an 18th century ship? And we know then that nowadays, obviously, uh, women sail all over. They've sailed single handedly across um, the Atlantic, um, around the world. And all women crews have completed, competed successfully in all kinds of ocean races. But for hundreds, if not thousands of years, seafaring was almost exclusively a male preserve. We know then from uh, sources that fishermen heave their nets and lines off the icy waters of Cape Cod to the dog bank. Their wives and daughters remain behind to kind of look after the young children and to make, make and mend the nets, and then to pray that the men survive the storms. Life in the Navy and on merchant ships was equally dangerous and predominantly a male occupation. We know then that these merchant and Navy ships were kind of better equipped to ride out storms than the smaller fishing boats, but they too were at the mercy of these uncharted um, seas, um, you know, with real poor navigation at times and death from scurvy and tropical disease and drowning was certainly common. Add to this absence from home, it was not unusual for seamen to say goodbye to their families and not see them for months, if not even years. You know, a seaman in the Royal Navy whose ship was sent to patrol the seas off the coast of West Africa might not return home for his port to his home port for two years. And on whaling voyages from you know the New England coast um, were, were often gone for several years um, at a time. Also on the ship then, uh, life on board the ship not only meant dangers and absences from home, um, but it also was this really kind of physical cramped condition. You know, life on the ship was wet and cramped and foul smelling. Um, so there's a couple of theories about why, why women are not kind of common on, on the ship. And I think one of the theories is that it is just a really unpleasant and dangerous place to be and you're away for a long time. So that's one of the theories. One of the other theories um, that is kind of the third point on the screen is that sailors were, um, were, were quite superstitious, which I guess makes sense when your profession exposes you to these really dangerous elements and uncontrollable natural disasters. And we know that, you know, um, sailors certainly had good luck charms and they believed in omens for bad luck. Um, and, you know, like there are some really random ones that a sea, a sea voyage that starts on a Friday is doomed, uh, bananas on board a ship are bad luck. And so there's all these kind of, um, you know, uh, superstitions that were, were to some extent, I think, believed in. So we know then that women were historically forbidden from sailing on military vessels or merchant ships uh, because captains quite often believed that their presence would anger the sea gods. And so this is one of the theories that some historians have and, and not all historians buy into this. And so we see this perhaps in earlier period that, that you know they didn't want women on there because it would upset the sea gods and it would cause rough and violent waves and weather. Um, so that's one of the theories, but there's been actually a lot of pushback against this. Um, we know then that another theory that historians have is that having a woman on an extended sea voyage when you're away for weeks or months could provoke jealousies and conflicts amongst the mainly male crew. In around 1808, Cuthbert Collingwood wrote, and this is a quote that gets churned out all the time, um, you know, I never knew a woman bought to sea in a ship that some mischief did not befall the vessel. Um, you know, as with so many sailors' superstitions, it's hard to discover some of the origins of this belief that having women on a ship might bring bad luck. And it's harder, too, to find the primary sources to kind of back this up. 
We do know then that the British Navy was at times prepared to turn a blind eye to the wives of Warren officers living on board. And we do know that the wives of captains, diplomats, colonial governors did frequently travel overseas without bringing any harm to themselves or their fellow passengers. And those naval officers who did object to the presence of women on their ships seem to have regarded them more of as a, a nuisance rather than any source of, of real bad luck. So women did go to sea in this period, uh, and they did go to sea in reality in many capacities as servants, um, as prostitutes, as laundresses, as cooks, um, and albeit less frequently as sailors, as uh, working in the Navy, uh, working on whaling vessels, or as we know with Bonnie and Reed as pirates. Um, you know, writing in 1762, there's actually an anonymous writer who said, you know, there are so many women actually in the British Army that they deserve their own separate battalions. And, you know, how true that is in reality is, is yet to be seen, but it certainly suggests there are more women than we actually think. So what about pirate ships then? Well, you know, I think pirate ships... Um, or perhaps arguably one of the most democratic places in, in the world, actually, in the early 18th century. And the reason for that is that many people who turned pirate had come from a maritime background. Uh, you, you didn't want to turn pirate if you were a landlubber. It was not the career for you. And so people who turned pirate had often suffered all kinds of abuse um, working on uh, merchant ships, naval ships, uh, privateering ships, uh, all kinds of other ships. And they were very keen that when they turned pirate to have the ships be as fair and democratic as possible. So um, again, I'm more than happy to talk about democracy on pirate ships in the Q&A. Um, you know, I can talk about that for hours in the Q&A if anyone's interested. But I think that this is perhaps what kind of sets the stage for Bonnie and Reed in terms of how pirate ships were governed. And uh, the quote you see on the screen is, um, is from a, a contemporary account, and it's worth reading at length. So they, i.e. the pirates, chose a captain from amongst themselves, who in effect held little more than that title, excepting in an engagement, when he commanded absolutely without control. So he, the captain, um, for most of the time, is, is just the same as everyone else, except when they are seizing vessels. So most of them, having suffered formally from the ill treatment of their officers, provided carefully against such evil. Now they had the choice in themselves. By their orders, they provided especially against quarrels, which might happen amongst themselves, and appointed certain punishments for anything that tended that way. For the due execution thereof, there constituted other officers beside the captain. So very industrious were they to avoid putting too much power into the hands of one man. So, you know, they really wanted to kind of split this power and not have one person uh, in charge, apart from when they were seizing ships. So one of the kind of really interesting primary sources that Johnson's A General History includes are uh, a handful of, of pirate governing documents that are known as pirate codes. And we see in these uh, fleeting references to women. Um, so one of the kind of contemporary pirates who was operating on a different ship uh, around the time as uh, Bonnie and Reed were operating on Rackham's ship, um, Bartholomew Roberts had, had this written into his, his pirate code, you know, no boy or woman to be allow, allowed amongst them. He also said for any women captives they got, uh, they'd be put um, basically on, be, they put a guard immediately over her to prevent ill consequences from so dangerous an instrument of division and quarrel. So basically, you know, in this kind of hyper masculine world, um, it wasn't safe for the woman to be there for, for her own safety, but also. Um, for the safety of the crew, they didn't want them fighting over the, the woman. Uh, other, other pirates described how in their codes, if any man were found seducing any of the latter sex and carried her to sea disguised, he was to suffer death. Uh, and I've not put it on the screen, but there's other pirate codes that describe how um, pirates were not allowed to, me uh, to meddle with a prudent woman. So a prudent woman is someone who is not a prostitute. So again, like kind of pushing back on some of these um, ideas that we might have about pirates. Uh, 
Another really interesting primary source comes from William Snellgrave, who is a trader in enslaved peoples in, in the same time period in the early 18th century. And Snellgrave then is actually held captive by pirates off of the coast of Africa. Uh, and in 1719, this is what he describes as he's held on uh, as a captive. He says, it's a rule amongst the pirates not to allow women to be on board their ships when in the harbor. And if they should take a price at sea that has any women on board, no one dares on pain of death to force them against their inclination. So they, they can't rape a woman. Um, you know, this has been a good political rule to prevent disturbances amongst them, and it's strictly observed. So we see this written into some of the governing codes of um, pirates. I'm going to talk for five more minutes then. So I just did a case study with you of two of the kind of most interesting female pirates from the early 18th century. So Anne Bonny and Mary Reed were not the only pirates to operate in, 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 this, um, in this dangerous, typically men's world. Another example that I want to briefly share with you skips forward a bit, actually. We go forward to the early 19th century and geographically we shift completely and we go to the South Sea of China. So female pirate um, known as Ching Si or Cheng Gao Sai, we see her go by both names. Um, she was formerly a prostitute, uh, but she married a pirate captain whose name was Cheng and joined him as a wife of Cheng as uh, an equal in the piracy business that he operated off the southeast of China. So they operated, you know, in tandem for several years until her husband died um, in 1807. And Chen Gao Sai then, in a really dynamic uh, move, took full control of the piracy enterprise upon her husband's death. Now, historians have written about uh, Chen Gao Sai quite extensively, and one of the things that they kind of credit her with is that as soon as her husband dies, um, she makes her husband's second in command, a guy called Chang Pao, the official captain of the fleet. And so while he then leads the men into the battle, Cheng Ao Sao focused her attention on the business, the military, stats, the military strategy, and the enormous task of growing this growing body of pirates under her command. And she was actually so successful as a pirate, um, she kind of dominates, she has this pirate monopoly in, in this area of the South Seas of China, and her fleet exceeded the sizes and the size of many contemporary country navies. Um, she commanded, um, you know, around 300 ships at one point, um, and she had between 20 to 40,000 pirates perhaps under her command. Um, other estimates suggest that it could be as much as like 1,800 ships or even up to 80,000 people under her command. So even if we go with the low estimate or the big estimate, she was a very powerful woman. We know that she expanded the scope of the business. Um, she kind of branched out from simple attack and pillage jobs to protection, to protection schemes, blackmail, extortion. Um, and we know that her reach eventually extended to the mainland where she goes on to set up a really extensive spy network. Um, and so she's a really interesting, um, I think, counterpoint to Grace O'Malley um, in terms of chronology ge geography but also the, the way that she works as a, as a pirate and she sets these really harsh laws actually again that I'm happy to talk about in the Q&A um, and so eventually then she gets bought in um, by the the local um, law enforcement um, agencies and you know as the authorities are on her tail she proves to be even more successful than her male counterparts and she repelled attack after attack both by Chinese naval vessels and also many Portuguese and British bounty hunters that have been brought in specifically to try and capture her. And then what happens in it is, um, you know, after a few years of this, um, the Chinese government tries a really different tactic and they offered basically universal pirate amnesty in exchange for peace. And Cheng Gao Sao jumps at this opportunity and basically heads to the, the negotiating table. Um, and she kind of settles this deal. And, you know, many of her men basically 
you know don't have uh, don't have to have a punishment and only a few of them are brought to trial uh, and many of her men go on to take military jobs they keep their loot and she retires with her loot she gets a new husband um a former right hand man actually she opens a gambling house and she dies around 1844 as a grandma um and then the last example, I'm going to wrap this up in a minute, that I want to kind of go back in time to is Grace O'Malley, who goes by multiple of other names, such as Grand Whale or Granine. Um, and we're going back in time to the early 16th century for Grace's story. And we're going geographically back across the ocean to come full circle to Ireland. So Grace O'Malley then was a famous pirate seafarer trader and chieftain in Ireland in the early 16th century. She was born around 1530 in County Mayo in Ireland, that's the map that you see on the screen, and as a young child um, sources suggest that Grace always knew that she wanted to be a sailor. Um, her father then, who was um, in the maritime industry himself refused to take her on sailing trips. And, and legend kind of has it that Grace chopped off all of her hair dressed in boys clothing to prove to her father that she too could handle the trip and life as a seafarer. Uh, and I guess seeing this, her father and her brothers laughed out loud and, and, and nicknamed her um, Bald Grace. Um, but Eventually then, I guess through her persistence, she was indeed allowed to go to sea with her father and his fleet of ships. And we know that as a kid, Grace often sailed with her father on multiple trading missions. Um, the sources suggest then that Grace would um, intercept ships traveling across the mouth of the bay. She would be uh, in charge of kind of collecting levies for safe passage. She was involved in plundering anyone who did not comply. Um, and that we know as time goes on, Grace also sailed further afield, either on peaceful trading missions or on raids against the English and Irish enemies. Um, so, we know then that whilst her father's still alive, Grace had been instructed to hide below deck if they were ever attacked. But uh, on one particular day, she did not heed this advice. And instead, when the ship was under attack, she climbed up onto the sail rigging. And watching the battle from above, she noticed an English um, pirate attacking up, uh, just kind of sneaking up behind her father and raising a dagger behind his back. Uh, and again, as the story goes, I'm certain it's been embellished, but it's a good story nonetheless that you know, Grace leapt off the rigging, she sailed through the air onto the pirate's back, uh, you know, screaming all the while. And essentially this distraction caused enough of um, uh, a distraction um, for the O'Malley's to regain control of the ship and to, you know, defeat the English. Um, we also know then that over time, she operates as a pirate for around 40 years. Um, we know that Grace expands a business, uh, taking on Turkish and Sp Spanish pirate ships, and she takes on English fleets. Um, she grew her estate to include a fleet of ships as well as several islands and castles along the west coast of Ireland. Grace married twice during her life. And what's really interesting is um, she gets caught up with war with the English. And so what the English do in the late 16th century is they send um, a colonial governor over to Ireland and the colonial governor in Grace's region is um, particularly oppressive. His name is Sir, Sir Richard Bingham. And Grace then is so fed up of him interfering with her business that she writes to Queen Elizabeth I. And the queen unbelievably agrees to meet Grace O'Malley at Greenwich Palace in um, 1593. And this is the image that you see here, Queen here, Elizabeth I and, and Grace O'Malley here. Um, and so she basically goes to the Queen and says, you look, you've, you're taking my inheritance from me, you know, from, you know, my husband's death. Um, she says, I want all of this return. You know, her son had been captured, her brother has been captured. And she says, if, if you do all of this, um, I'll use my strength and leadership to defend you, Queen Elizabeth I, by both land and sea. Um, 
as you can see from the slightly later image at the top, uh, Grace refused to bow to Queen Elizabeth. Um, she did not recognize her as Queen of Ireland. And some report that, I don't know if you see on the image here, there's a handkerchief on the floor that um, she asked for a handkerchief from, from the Queen and she, she blew this kind of fancy laced edged handkerchief and she threw it on the fire that you see behind there and everyone was apparently really horrified. Um, so more importantly though, um, we have primary sources that survive at the public record office in London that talk about, that, that lists all of the complaints that Grace sent to Queen Elizabeth I. We also know that Grace did have the land um, returned back to her. Her son and brother were uh, released. Um, but really, I feel like Grace didn't get all of her rightful possessions. She dies um, when she's almost 70 uh, at Rockfleet um, in the year 1603, and she does leave her sons to run her fleet. Um, there's a bunch of monuments to Grace O'Malley in Ireland, and you should definitely check them out. There's one at Rockfleet. Uh, there's also one of the castles that she takes over here. So if you ever get the chance to see Grace O'Malley, uh, do. And if you want to learn more, this is my last slide and we'll take five minutes for questions. Um, I have a bunch of books that I would love to recommend to you. Um, my favorite book about pirates of all times is by um, one of my favorite of historians of all times, Marcus Rettiger, Villains of All Nations, Atlantic Pirates in the Golden Age. Um, this is a book that really advocates that pirate ships were hugely democratic in the early 18th century. And he has a chapter on Anne Body and Mary Reed in there. There's also this book, Iron Men, Wooden Women, Gender and Sea Foreign in the Atlantic World from 1700 to 1920. There's David Cordingley's book, Sea Foreign Women, um, Adventures of Pirate Queens, uh, Female Stowaways and Sailors' Wives. And then another great book uh, that I also set in my pirates class is Bandits at Sea, a Pirate Reader that has an edited collection from all really leading historians. And it has essays on there on Grace O'Malley, Cheng Gao Sao, and obviously Anne Bonny and Mary Reed. So with that, then I will pause here. Let me just stop my screen share. Bear with me one second. I'll pause there and I'll take some questions. I'm sorry that I talked a little bit longer. I was hoping to finish in exactly you know, 55 minutes or so, uh, but I'll happily stay behind for a minute or two after eight to take questions. Let's have a look, is there something in the chat? Yeah, so we did have a request about expanding on the two main ways to become yes. a pirate. I was hoping someone would ask about that. So there are two main ways. Um, the kind of most dramatic way is that, um, you know, pirates um, are out on a privateering vessel, right? And a privateering vessel is in many ways comparable to pirates. And uh, privateers then do all the crimes that pirates do. You know, they seize vessels, they ransom people, they plunder things, you know, they kill people. But they have a letter of mark that is from either the king or a colonial governor that says, you know, you can attack a French ship, um, a, a Dutch ship or whichever ship we're at war at. Um, and so the people on, on trading vessels get really fed up of their masters and they decide then in option one of becoming a pirate of um, overthrowing their captain, probably killing their captain because they've been oppressed by him and you know throwing him overboard and then signing their own um, pirate code and, and raising the Jolly Roger. So this kind of mutiny on, a, on, a, on a, another type of maritime vessel is, is, is way number one, which is the most dramatic way, but it's, it's not the most common way. Um, the vast majority of uh, people who turn pirate in the early 18th century are, um, are captured by pirate vessels themselves. So a pirate vessel would, would come up to another vessel whilst they're right out on the high seas and they would, they would board it. Um, and they would basically, typically speaking, only have um, violent encounters for the most part with the, the leadership on the ship. Um, what they would then do is offer the rest of the crew the opportunity to join them. And so people would voluntarily join uh, pirate ships when their ships were captured. Um, for the most part, people who turned pirate uh, volunteered to do so. Pirates didn't very often force people to join their ship. 
ships. Um, they didn't want people on there who didn't want to be on there. Um, they had this very democratic government. And if people weren't going to follow their pirate codes, they, they, there wasn't necessarily the place for them on the ship. So for the most part, uh, the second way of becoming pirates, volunteering when your ship was captured, was, was the most common in the early 18th century. Um, as the 18th century progresses, we do see there are cases where pirates do force people to join their ship, typically as um, the authorities are closing in them, on them, or if they have a particular job that they need filling, maybe their cooper, the person who makes the barrels has just died, and they um, need to fill that position. But for the most part, it would be volunteering. So yeah, that's the first question. Yeah, I see the, the second question about literacy. Yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to say we really don't have um, that many written documents um, from pirates. The way, and, and Susan will know this from her thesis on pirate executions, one of the ways that we typically hear pirate voices is our execution sermon. So when pirates were put to death, um, you know, the minister would go and there would be a huge news activity um, and, and this, the minister would talk to the pirates before they're put to death. And, and we tend to hear their words and their voices translated through the written words of the ministers who are, are preaching their last words to them. So it's it's not common at all that, that we, we have those written documents. And when we do hear their voices, it's secondhand from authority figures writing about them. Um, the, the published sources from, you know, Charles Johnson are, are published. We don't have those manuscript sources. And even things such as um, pirate flags you know I, I'm happy to talk more about those as well um we really don't have those surviving flags there's probably one or two from the from the later period of piracy because many of those were, were destroyed too so yeah really we don't have we don't have any evidence of this this literacy not to say that some some of the pirates might have been literate but we just don't have those sources to prove that uh and then I'm reading the other question, can you also chat more in regard to the governance on, on yes, on, on both pirate ships and uh, animals on board as well? Yes, excellent. So um, one of the things that um, when I'm teaching my class on piracy is I like to kind of dispel myths about pirates. And as I kind of hinted to you, um, pirate ships in this period in the early 18th century were perhaps one of the most democratic places in, in all of the world at the time. Um, they divided up the loot fairly. They had actually um, a really early form of like social security. So if someone got injured in action, um, they would provide for them. Um, they um, welcomed a really diverse crew of people uh, that is not typical in other maritime professions for the time. Um, they also um, only, as, as I said with the clip, only give their, their captain absolute authority when they are um, seizing other ships. But for the rest of the time, the captain is just another member of the crew. And they had very specific rules that they all democratically voted on. All of the crew members voted on what the rules were going to be. Um, and so compared to the, the other maritime um, occupations at the time, pirate ships were really, really very democratic. And Marcus Retica's book is all about that. Yeah, animals on board as well. So they would have animals on board in, to, to eat, just like, you know, other ships would do too. Um, you know, you're crossing the Atlantic, you want to have like chickens for eggs and then to kill them. Um, you would often have pigs on board. Um, there's a really amazing article that um, I'll happily send to Susan at, at the end that she can distribute to you. She has your emails, presumably, that talks about um, exotic animals on pirate ships. Like, why, when we imagine pirates, do we imagine a pirate with a parrot on his shoulder, right? Like, that's one of the stereotypes. And, and there is some evidence that pirates uh, and other maritime workers, too, did pick up exotic pets as they were traveling around the world. And so the, the, pi the parrot is just one of them. Uh, monkeys are actually reasonably common on ships too. Um, my book I'm writing right now is, is on the horse trade. So I'm looking at the movement, not on pirate ships, but of horses from New England down to the West Indies. So yeah, animals, it's a, it's a crazy world and I can only imagine how bad it smelt on those ships actually. Um, oh yes, I will send that article to Susan. I don't think I can send the PDF in here. And it's, it's a type of article that's like, 
you wouldn't be able to access unless you had like database access. So I, I don't want to give you the reference and not send it. So I'll, I'll send you the PDF um, to Susan. And the other thing is also I'll pop my email in the chat. So if anyone wants to email me directly, feel free to. And you can Google me. I have a long, weird name, Charlotte Carrington Farmer. So I am the first person who comes up if you Google that name. So feel free to just Google me and reach out. Yeah, thank you for joining me uh, and stay warm in this snow. Yeah, thank you everyone so much for logging on. Um, I will be sending out a little recap email. Um, this was recorded. So if you missed anything at the beginning, um, you can check out the recording. Um, that email will come out this week and I'll um, have Charlotte's article that she's going to send us and her contact information again if anyone has any further questions. Thank you so much to Charlotte for coming on and talking to us. Um, this was amazing, kind of reliving my pirate days. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, and have a good night.